In the 1920s, when the car industry really started to take off and lots of people had cars, the Michelin Tire Company decided it would be a good idea to find ways to drum up business. And so one of the things they thought they would do was help people figure out places to go, because if you drive your car, you'll need more stuff for your car, like more tires. So they began to produce guidebooks, the Guide Michelin, to give you directions, turn left, turn right. Certainly before there were lots of road signs, it would have been important to know which tree is the landmark to know where you're supposed to make a left-hand turn. But being French, of course, it didn't take them long before they discovered that what you really want is to drive to a really good meal. And so they began to write in their book also where the good restaurants were. Those that were good if you happened to be passing, those that were good if you made a little detour off the road, and those that were so good you should make a, you should make a special trip just to go to that restaurant. And so down to this day, long after we've ceased to worry too much about books to tell us where to turn and, and what to look for for landmarks, the Guide Michelin is still sort of the Rolls Royce of restaurant reviews. And around the world, chefs and restaurants covet having a star, one star, two stars, or three stars, based on the level of quality that the guide says that restaurant has. And they'll do lots of things to get it and then to keep it. So it's all the more surprising that twice in recent years I've read articles in newspapers, New York Times or wherever else, about restaurants that have decided to give up their stars. A couple of years ago, it was a story about a restaurant in a little town in France that had very little going for it. Uh, sort of industry had passed it by, there wasn't much left. But for some reason, a native son of this town had opened a restaurant that was a very good quality. He got himself a Michelin star for it. But he had decided that the, the, the cost of maintaining the restaurant at the level required to maintain the star was no longer worth it. And so he gave his star up. Recently, in just over the holidays, there was an article about a, a chef at a three-star restaurant, the highest possible, who had decided that his rating was holding him back, back from trying anything new. Because heaven forbid you should make something on the day when one of the reviewers was there and that something was a little too experimental or not quite in keeping with what they thought your restaurant was about. And so he gave it up because he felt it was constraining him too much. He wanted to try new things. All this talk of stars should make you think a little perhaps about Epiphany, the season when a new star is seen over us when we are called to follow it wherever it is that God may be leading, probably in some new way, we hope. This happens to us every day of our lives, just to be clear, but in Epiphany we think about it particularly, the new light, the new star that has appeared in our sky, and what it may be calling us to do. If we're going to do what the chefs in those two examples did, we're going to have to figure out what it is perhaps that's holding us back, what it is that we're working too much on that keeps us from doing what it is that God is calling us to do. In some cases, that's not too difficult. Certainly, we can see when, we're, when what we're following or what we're doing, or more likely what someone else is following or doing, is actively evil. It's not too hard to tell the difference between good and evil most of the time when they're clear enough. The harder case, I think, is when the things that we value, the things that we're following, the things that we're holding on to are arguably good, but may not necessarily fit with what it is that God is intending us to do now. We get examples of that in, in the lessons this morning. In the Old Testament lesson, Samuel and Eli, I've, I've explained this story to you before, but a little backstory is probably not unhelpful in this case as well. It actually begins with a woman named Hannah, who in an earlier story is shown to have been someone who had great difficulty getting pregnant. And so she's in the temple praying to God and crying as she pours out her sorrow to God that she's been unable to have a child. And Eli, the priest, who is the same one who's in the story this morning, is there and sees her, assumes incorrectly that she's drunk, and goes over to you know, give her what for and throw her out. She explains no why she's there, and he is moved by her story and gives her a blessing that it may be with her according to the will of God, and almost immediately she becomes pregnant. 
the child she has, her first son, is Samuel. And as is the custom in Judaism, the first son, the first child nowadays, is dedicated to God. Now, in later times, by the time of Jesus, when you see Jesus' parents doing the same thing, you take your child to the temple, you make an offering, you make a sacrifice, you take your child away, and everything has been taken care of. But in this story, earlier in the history of Israel, what it meant was you took your oldest son to the temple, and he became a kind of acolyte, professionally. Served, lived in the temple, did whatever the, the, the priest needed to have done to, to keep things going. And that's what Samuel is doing. Eli, ironically, has become his boss. And he is serving under Eli in, in keeping the temple going. In this case, keeping the, the light, someone, someone being in the presence of the light of God until it goes out. So you can imagine that Samuel feels a certain amount of beholdenness to Eli, his boss, this person who takes care of him, who has given him a job, who gives him a sort of sense of his value in, in, in the temple. So he wouldn't necessarily want to take this bad news he just got to his boss. He might also have felt a certain sense of, of kindness. I mean, maybe I can somehow redact this message. I can take out the worst bits. I can, I can pass it on in a sort of softened form. Yet that's not what he does, because Eli, again, ironically, is the one who gives him a little bit of starch and says, whatever it is, you got to tell me. Samuel is being called into a new way of life, becoming prophetic. He wouldn't necessarily have known what this message was, because who would think God was going to show up and give him or her some, some deep and important message about the world? And we, that happened to us. And yet that was what Samuel was being called into. We can see him beginning to live into in the way the story ends. Taking the message to Eli and receiving that validation, which is very much to Eli's credit. This is the word of God. This is the will of God. Let it happen according to the will of God. Who are we to say otherwise? A nice shot in the arm for Samuel as he begins his career, which continues, as you see in the last line of that, all through his life as a prophet of God in Israel. Now, you compare that with the New Testament story where we have Nathaniel, who in the other three Gospels is called Bartholomew because Nathaniel and Bartholomew sound so much alike, I guess. I don't know. For some reason, only the Gospel of John calls him Nathaniel. Clearly, he's a little sarcastic. He's told that they have found the Messiah, and the Messiah is this guy from Nazareth. He says, well, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Because he has read the prophets. He knows where God is supposed to act, and it's not in Nazareth. It's over there somewhere. So he is approaching this new information, this new turning in his life, from the perspective of, well, we've never done it that way. This isn't what I was taught. This is not what my faith has enabled me to get to this point in my life by believing. And we see the turning for him in being open to this idea that perhaps God is doing something new and different. And going and seeing that wonderful charismatic phrase, come and see, that we hear again and again in the Gospels and that should be inspiring our lives as well every day. Come and see. We get a little taste of this hidden even in this strange, seemingly out of place reading from St. Paul that we heard this morning. When he's talking about fornication. I think part of what he's getting at is the way that we just, by nature, by the way that we're made, are looking to be in relationships with other people, looking for that desire to have connections with other people. But if we do that in an ungodly way, not only does it injure our relationship with God, it doesn't even produce what we wanted it to doesn't even produce the relationship with others that we are desiring. So the turning is to recognize that that godly relationship is truly what fulfills us. And that, that being in relationship with God ultimately corrects and enriches and creates the relationships we have with everyone else. If only we will see it. So, all those examples I could sit down and say amen and leave everyone to figure out where it is they need to turn. 
but I don't think that's quite enough. I think there are hidden in these stories a couple of clues for how it is that we might be looking for where the star is shining over us, what new star perhaps we are being called to follow in our walk with God. The first comes from Samuel and this idea of, uh, of listening. I've been talking all this time about stars and looking, but now I have to make a hard right turn, to use the Michelin metaphor, and talk instead about listening and hearing. Part of what Samuel is doing at first is hearing but not listening. So knowing how to listen, which seems like it ought to be obvious, is a really important spiritual skill. And for this, I have something from congregational development, organizational development that may help us. It's the concept of active listening. Do I see any nods? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Or one couple corporate people know what I'm talking about. I have an acronym for it. It has five letters, and I remember what four of them were meant to be during the 8 o'clock sermon, but because I forgot the fifth one during 8 o'clock, I know I'll remember that one this time. The acronym is BUILD, B-U-I-L-D. The B is body language. The way that we stand, the way that we look when we're talking to people says something about whether we're listening or not. I was talking to somebody between services today, and when I'm in this costume, it's hard to just sort of stand there. You have to figure out what you're going to do. I was standing like this, and I realized, wait, that's kind of a closed thing that says I'm not really open to you. So I keep doing this to remind myself. That, in turn, got me to thinking, how often do I do this when I'm talking to God? Or more to the point, how often do I do this when God is talking to me? If we're always doing this when God is talking, how much are we really listening and how much is just washing over us, going past, going over our heads, being open physically as much as spiritually is an important start in the way that we listen. The you Honest to goodness, it was the L last time, now it's going to be the U. Understanding. How often in recent conversations, and here I am criticizing myself as much as anyone else, have we listened to what the other person was saying so we would get the opening to say what we wanted to say anyway? I know the points I want to make, and I'm using you as my excuse to make the points I want to make, because sooner or later you'll say what I want to be my cue. And how often are we really, truly listening for what the message is? This is exactly what, not exactly, this is, this is more or less what Samuel was doing. He was listening to hear what he expected, which was the message, come and help me because I can't get up. When in reality, that was not the message at all. And it was only once he had been told, and in a way taught, to listen with understanding, speak for your servant is listening, that he's able to listen and truly understand what the words are meant to mean. I is don't interrupt. Once again, many of us are bad at this. I watch a fair amount of, of court proceedings on YouTube. I find it interesting the way that, that the justice system does and doesn't work. And so I learn a lot, I think, about the law from doing that. And one of the things I really learned from that, that I try to use in my own life, is that in court only one person can talk at a time because they're taking it all down to make a record of it. I realize that the reason why a lot of people trip over this when they're in court is that in conversation, we're typically talking over each other all the time. We just can't do that. Sometimes there has to be uninterrupted listening and uninterrupted speaking to truly communicate. How often in our prayer life do we ask God for something, get the beginning of an answer and say, okay, I can do that and, and run away, failing to hear the fullness of it, or perhaps deliberately making sure we don't hear the fullness of it because there might be something hard that comes along later in the answer. L is look them in the eye. How often do we not really engage with the people we're talking to? Something about looking someone in the eye, being in person, that encourages deep and true listening. 
How often are we in person with God? How often do we look God in the eye? How often do we fear looking God in the eye? There is an honesty in it that perhaps we're just a little afraid of sometimes. And then D is don't judge. Samuel could easily have decided that Eli really was this, this wicked person and he was done with him. He doesn't. He goes back to doing what he did before once he receives the message. That's between God and Eli. It's in the Narnia books that Aslan is always telling the various characters, I only ever tell you your own story. Part of that is because there's so much that is between God and each individual soul between God and each individual community of believers that the rest of us truly can't understand because we're not that person, we're not in that community. There is so much that we cannot and should not judge about the way other people live their lives of faith. And if we will observe that rule, we may find there are much greater depths in other people than we ever realized. So, active listening an important skill for us individually and us collectively as a community of followers of Jesus. The second thing that helps us to see where God may be calling us, where God is leading us, is the idea of come and see. The idea that somehow we have to be open to the idea that God may be doing something new and different. And for this, I also have an acronym. This is also from Organizational Development this is called Appreciative Inquiry. I don't see any nods for this one. Companies may not use this quite as much. And this is five Ds. It just happens to work out. They made shoehorn concepts into words so they'd all have the same first letter. It begins with discover. Very often, we make the assumption that we know what other people think. We know, even worse, what God thinks. It's just easier to assume that whatever we got the last time is the last word, and we'll just keep going with it indefinitely. That certainly is the way many of us try to live our lives of faith. Jesus loves me, this I know. I learned it in kindergarten, therefore it's how I will live the rest of my life. If we're not willing to discover, to find new things along the way, how impoverished will our faith and our life of faith be? The second is to, uh, now I'm going to screw up on this one and forget what the letters were for. Discover. The second piece, effectively, whatever the word was, which is now lost from my mind, never turned 50, that's all I can tell you, is to truly appreciate whatever it is, to delight in it. That wasn't the word, but it'll work in this case. To see where the good is in it, where the good is in what God is calling us to do, what the possibilities might be. To truly see what the value is in what we have discovered. The third D is dream. To allow all those new things, the new possibilities to sink into us, to sink into our souls, and to begin to influence even our dreams. Sometimes the craziest new ideas come from our dreaming. Simply to say, well, now I have the pieces, I'll run with it, isn't enough. Until we dream, until we allow ideas and the words of God that are put into our souls to germinate, how can we possibly hope to use them in the way God intends? The fourth is design. You'll notice there were three that involved just looking at, appreciating, and expanding before we ever get to doing anything with it. And here, once again, I preach to myself, how often do we rush, rush in and say, we need a solution right now? How important it is to do all those other things first before we begin to design before we go and see. And yet how important it is that once we have done all of that discovering and talking and appreciating and dreaming that we in fact do go. If we don't go, how will we ever know? 
and then the fifth, and just because it happens to have a D at the beginning, is destiny. What they meant by that when they put it together was to suggest that it's only by going and seeing that we discover what it is God will do. It's only that we can truly evaluate what it is that has been revealed to us through what we do and then look back and see what it is we have accomplished. So, dear friends, we stand under a new star today, tomorrow, every day of our lives. Will we turn? Will we see it? Will we listen to what God is calling us to do? Will we go and see? I pray that we will. If we will, God will reveal much to us. Let us go, let us see. Let us follow where the star leads. Amen.